Hello, everyone, and welcome. This BPAL signature event is brought to you by Harvard's Office of the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning. Our speaker today is Kareem Lakani, a professor of business administration at the Harvard Business School. He is the founding director of the Laboratory for Innovation Science here at Harvard and the principal investigator of the NASA Tournament Lab at the Harvard Institute for Quantitative Social Science. He is also the faculty co-founder of the Harvard Business School Digital Initiative and the Harvard Business Analytics Program. Kareem specializes in technology management and innovation. His research examines crowd-based innovation models and the digital transformation of companies and industries. If you're interested in learning more from Professor Lakani, we encourage you to join him in his six-week Harvard online course, Open Innovation, where he'll teach you strategies for finding the best ideas, solutions, and people necessary to solve your organization's most difficult problems. Please visit harvardonline.harvard.edu for more information. Kareem, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Alicia. Uh, great to be with everybody. You know, in many ways, we're having this uh, collective uh, uh, AI moment um, at the university. Uh, I was at a panel uh, uh, on Friday for Claudine Gay's inauguration. There were a bunch of academic panels, and there was one on generative AI. Uh, uh, dean Chris Dubbs from FAS, uh, the Dean for Science for FAS, uh, led that panel, and a tremendous degree of interest. So what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, use this session to sort of share with you some ideas that have already been developed, and also some very new emerging research uh, that has come out uh, uh, from our labs uh, to make sense of what's happening with generative AI and actually how it affects um, uh, sort of knowledge workers everywhere. Um, I prefer questions throughout, so please use the Q and A uh, to ask me questions uh, uh, right off the bat. Um, and uh, it feels a bit weird that it's, it feels like a one one way conversation. Uh, typically, have lots of folks looking at me and we're interacting, uh, but we'll try to make this uh, work as best as uh, as we can in this in this environment. So I'm going to share my screen. Most recently, also, I'm also now the co-founder and chair of the uh, Digital Data Design Institute at Harvard, uh, where we have uh, over 35 faculty members uh, from around HBS uh, working on. Uh, in 14 labs, uh, asking a bunch of questions about how the digital economy um, and this AI-powered world is changing organizations, changing business strategy, uh, changing operations, uh, with big implications for both how we develop these systems, but also um, the ways in which uh, we um, we are going to be impacted uh, uh, and socially and ethically as well. So, so the 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 founding uh, sort of perspective I have on on, on all of these technologies is actually uh, uh, based on a uh, um, a quote that I really sort of inhabit, uh, which is the future is already here; it's just not evenly distributed yet. Uh, and this quote really sort of uh, helps me sort of think about uh, how there's pockets of the world um, that in many ways are living in the future. Uh, and our job as researchers, as academics, um, as scholars, as practitioners, is to go figure out where those people are, where, how they're living, and then bring it back to our present reality uh, so that we can actually see a pathway uh, towards the future. Um, and to sort of put this in perspective, you know, if you were to just go back 20 years and look at companies that were sort of dominating the economy in terms of, you know, at least market capitalization as one metric, what you see is sort of uh, the usual suspects. Microsoft at that time uh, was, uh, you know, very, uh, it was a large company already, about $265 billion in market cap, GE, ExxonMobil, Walmart, you know, IBM and so forth. But uh, sort of a, a set of firms that are sort of in in a, a bunch of uh, aspects of our of our economy, healthcare, banking, retail, uh, oil and gas, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and certainly, you know, I started my career uh, at General Electric in 1993, and GE for the longest time was uh, was one of the largest conglomerates, largest uh, well capitalized firms in the in the U.S. Um, today, um, you know, it looks very different. Uh, first, if you just look at the at the numbers, it's kind of scary that you know we're orders of magnitude uh, greater than what we were before. 
Oh, but the firms you see, there's one oil and gas company, Saudi Aramco, and one sort of conglomerate, sort of Brookshire Hathaway. The rest have uh, everything to do with the digital economy, with platforms, um, with AI. So you think about Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, hardware maker, but really powering the air revolution, Meta, Tesla, self-driving cars, as well as electric cars, and TSMC as a foundry uh, doing um, uh, doing you know chip development as well. So much of the our pension funds, much of our investments globally are now in these firms because the market has sort of said and consumers have said, sort of said this is where the where the future uh, future belongs. And so that that helps us you know put this into context as to the world that we're living in. And one book that I would highly recommend to you. Uh, is actually uh, an executive fellow at our institute now, Azim Azar, um, a former BBC journalist, runs a great po podcast called The Exponential Age, and has a book called The Exponential Age, which really argues something profound, which is there's a set of technologies that can grow at an exponential rate. He certainly has AI and, and digital in there, but also you know, 3D printing, uh, also synthetic biology, and even sort of solar panels and, and solar. And what we see is that these technologies and these uh, organizations grow exponentially, and consumers also grow exponentially with these with these firms. And then there's the rest of us that grow linearly. This creates a gap in front of uh, of um, uh, for for us who are on the linear side of things, uh, but also for uh, folks that are living in both worlds. You know, many consumers are living with magical technologies on their on their mobile phones. Uh, at the same time, they have very poor experiences with 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 companies uh, that have you know different norms and expectations about how they will serve serve customers as well, and so this creates both an opportunity but also uh, chaos as well. So when we talk about this age of AI that we're living in, uh, you know, uh, in a book that I wrote with Mark Greenstein, we were really focused in on um, something that we saw that really captured our imagination. And this is a cool thing. This is a, an image that's known as the next Rembrandt. It was used by uh, Microsoft uh, researchers with funding from ING to go create what uh, Rembrandt would do today. And so I'm gonna show you a little video. And as you watch the video, this is from about six years ago, just look at all the steps they went through uh, to create this, this image, but keep thinking about like all the steps, right? And all the effort that went into it. You know, multi-million dollar project, several months, um, and um, and let's make sense of uh, of what we can do today with this. One of his great achievements, one of Rembrandt's great achievements, was to portray human emotions in a much more convincing way than artists had before him, and in many ways for all time. At ING, we believe in the power of innovation, what it can mean to people. We want to bring this innovative spirit to our sponsorship of Dutch art and culture. We knew that for this challenge, we needed to team up with experts from various fields to make this come to life. We're using a lot of data to improve business life. But we haven't been using data that much in a way that touches the human soul. You could say that we use technology and data like Rembrandt used his paints and his brushes to create something new. The first step was to study the works of Rembrandt in order to create an extensive database. We gather the data from his collection of paintings from many different sources, including 3D scans and upscale images using a deep learning algorithm. Because a significant percentage of Rembrandt paintings were portraits, we analyzed the demography of the faces in these paintings, looking at factors like gender, age, and head direction. The data led us to the conclusion that the subject should be a portrait of a Caucasian male with facial hair between 30 and 40 years old, in dark clothing with a collar, wearing a hat, and facing to the right. From there, we started to extract features only with faces that were related to that specific profile. And we had to create a whole painting from just data. 
and we used uh, statistical analysis and various algorithms to extract the features that make Rembrandt Rembrandt. We took parts of the face and we started to compare them. And then based on this, we're able to create a typical Rembrandt eye or nose or mouth or ear. After generating the features, we were focusing on the face proportions. We used an algorithm that can detect over 60 points in a painting. We were able to align the faces and to estimate the distance between the eyes, the nose and the mouth and the ears. A painting is not a 2D picture, it's 3D. You can see the canvas, you can see the brushes, and that's what makes the painting come alive. A hive map is essential to make the painting a painting. We incorporated the height map into the painting and printed on a 3D printer that uses a special paint base, UV ink. It printed many layers, one on top of the other, which resulted in the height and texture of the final painting. sometimes a magical moment to see a painting for the first time. Even if it's computer generated, for me it is something special. I would have believed if I would saw it in a museum that it would have been a, a real Rembrandt. Uh, just one I haven't seen before. So you get to see this thing, uh, and this really caught our imagination. What was interesting was the reaction. There's a set of people that loved it, right? They just said, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Um, uh, you know, AI just 3D printed a brand new Rembrandt and it's shockingly good. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, The Guardian wrote that there's a Rembrandt, a new way to mock art made by fools. And this pressure that we sort of see about the use of AI technology to do things that were reserved for humans is going to be the pressure that all of us will be facing, especially now in the era of chat GPT and so forth. That this is exactly the debates we're going to be having across our society, across our, our academy, across businesses um, about what to do uh, with these technologies um, and, and how will this uh, uh, come together. By the way, there's some great questions being asked. I'm going to get to many of these questions uh, as we go through the presentation as well. So what does our generation look like today? Um, you know, so I, I was, you know, my mom lives in Toronto and she was like, what is this AI thing, Kareem? Tell me what's going on. And so, so I asked her like, mom, like, like, who's your favorite actor? And she goes, well, um, she, you know, she's South Asian. So she, of course, she said Shah Rukh Khan. Shah Rukh Khan in many ways uh, is the most popular actor in the world. Um, you don't know much about him on this side of the world, but but certainly if you go to India or the Middle East or Africa, he's he's well, re really well known. And so I went into you know mid journey and I said you know let's let's imagine Shah Rukh Khan uh, as viewed by Rembrandt um, and also maybe as a as a uh, as a hipster in Brooklyn. Uh, and here's what got created to me in less than thirty seconds. So on the right is uh, Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, uh, as Rembrandt would do, 30 seconds. And then on the left, uh, Shah Rukh Khan as viewed uh, uh, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, uh, hipster in Brooklyn. I really love the bottom left image. Like I have aspirations for a beard like that, but I, I don't think I can be as, as cool uh, and with all those tattoos uh, as Shah Rukh Khan. And by the way, I think all the tattoos are fake as well but they look pretty realistic. And here's what's happened, right? So in the seven years since this Microsoft project was done, uh, the technology to do art, uh, to do any type of art um, has radically been democratized, radically available. You know, I think, you know, uh, you know, my daughter laughs, she's a, she's a, a student at RISD right now, uh, in our second year. And I don't know how she got her art genes, certainly not for me because I did terrible in art classes and in grade school and high school. Um, but here I am now able to just speak it and then I get you know really, really cool images. And this is part of, I think, the, the thing I want us to start to think about that all of a sudden we're creating some superpowers that are, to, that are available at 20 bucks a, a month. And what does this mean for us and how do we put this together? 
So for system clarity on definitions of AI, most people, when they think about AI, think about the left-hand side, which is really strong AI, which is sort of autonomous agents doing their own thing. That's the world of Star Wars and Star Trek and science fiction. That's not true yet. Okay, what's happening mostly today is what's known as weak AI, which is basically computers doing some tasks that humans did, and we can do them at scale, we can do them really well, uh, but it's not sort of uh, sentient beings on their own. This is just algorithms, statistics, right? Data and compute working together to do things that look appear magical, but really still is what's known as weak AI in computer science. Um, and of course, there's a ton of hype. Right? There's a ton of hype about this. And when you sort of think about hype, I want you to think about it in two dimensions. One is from a supply perspective and one is from a demand perspective. What's happening from the supply perspective is like the cost to innovate with AI has dropped radically. Like the example I just gave you, right? Millions of dollars to create the next Rembrandt. Now we're 20 bucks a month, I can do the same thing, okay? The cost has dropped radically. At the same time, the demand has gone up through the roof because people are reimagining every single use case as an AI use case. We can think about dentistry as an AI use case. We can think about self-driving, driving as an AI use case, right? We can think about creating uh, emails as an AI use case. And so basically the hype has happened because the cost to innovate has dropped radically, right? And at the same time, people are, are using their imaginations to come up with a whole new set of use cases. And this is impacting both existing firms, right? But also lots of startups as well in this space. And that's why the hype is, 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 is real. And just to sort of show you what this looks like, I love this example of like, potentially rethinking uh, use cases with AI. So this comes from JD Digits in China, right? They were asked to create an insurance company uh, for Chinese farmers. They said, oh, let's go after providing uh, you know, services to pig farmers in China. They realized that what they could do is they could take uh, facial recognition software for humans on the right-hand side, apply for pigs. Apparently pigs also can be recognized with facial recognition, they have unique faces. And all of a sudden they built a camera infrastructure in the farm. And then not only did they basically digitize the entire farm, but they were able to then at low cost digitize you know, what the pigs were doing, understanding what they were eating, and then offering a range of services from, from feed pr production to the next stage in the, in the poor pig's life as well. Right, so it's a new type of a company that has emerged that has sort of rethought this this problem. Um, similarly, in the work that I've been doing in our lab at, at the Laboratory for Innovation Science, uh, you know, we do a lot of crowdsourcing experiments, um, and what we see is that uh, AI solutions work really well. And so the thing to note is that we have this paper published in 2019 in JAMA Oncology, uh, where we showed that for fifty thousand dollars. In eight weeks, we could create algorithms uh, that were really good at, at lung cancer uh, uh, volumetric analysis so that you could do radiation therapy planning. Typically, this takes a long time by radiation therapist, and we could get this done uh, you know, very fast and be equally as good as a, as a Harvard-trained radiation oncologist. Now, the thing to note uh, about the low cost of innovating with AI is that you know, I'm, a, I'm a last co-author on this paper, um, you know, with Ava Guinan and Raymond Mack. So Ray Mack and Ava are the only two doctors in this, the real doctors, oncologists. The rest are, you know, physicists and computer scientists. And then I have a PhD from MIT in management, right? So here I am publishing in GEM Oncology, uh, talking about cancer uh, AI systems uh, out of a business school, uh, showing what can be done. So again, we can reimagine use cases and we can also uh, massively lower the cost of innovating um, with AI. And so in a book that I wrote with Mark Levine CD in 2020, we, we really sort of saw this emergence of a new company uh, that was structured in a very different way than the companies of the last century, right? They were systematically applying digital technologies, platform thinking and AI in both their business model, how they create value and how they capture value, uh, but also their operating model. And one of the famous examples that we use, and this is one of the questions that was asked, what are some examples of AI first companies? I think again, China is very instructive and Ant Group uh, in many ways for me, uh, even though they have been defamed in many ways by the Chinese government, really showed us a way forward. So 
Ant uh, Group is basically PayPal for China, but it's not just PayPal, it's not just escrow, but in fact has built a multi-product platform company. Uh, but here's the thing that's so interesting about them. They have uh, you know, 1.2 billion users um, and uh, only 15,000 employees, right? So 1.2 billion users, 15,000 employees, and so that's a very different organization than you know typically what our local banks would do in terms of financial services. Uh, they have a rule called three one zero. You know, three minutes to apply for any any product, one minute for approval, zero human intervention. Three one zero. And I often joke that you know my bank, which I've been banking since I moved from Canada to, to the U.S. in 1997, also has three one zero, but it's like three months for an application, one month for approval and zero computers, right? It's all done by fax machines and paper. But here you can see a company that is set up in a very different way. And what we see when we analyze this company is that they, they their value creation is really based on products, the products that they offer and what they, what they do, but also the ecosystem that they're in, the platform that they're in, uh, but also the data, right? All these three things come together to get them to supercharge themselves. And inside these companies, when we sort of open up the hood and look at the operating model, the data and algorithms are at their core, right? And the logic is, as you have more data, you build better algorithms. As you build better algorithms, you have better services. As you build better services, you get more usage. And you're basically in this, in this flywheel. And so this, this becomes a core thing. And then inside these firms is an AI factory, which industrializes the data analysis process. Right now, much of data analysis that happens everywhere is what I call boutique and craft-based, right? We have data scientists working closely with managers, handcrafting models, building, for example, dashboards to take some action. When you're in an AI factory uh, perspective, you are basically industrializing three things. You're industrializing predictions across your business. So think about even a place like Harvard, all the predictions we make. We make pr uh, predictions about enrollment. We make predictions about yield. We make predictions about many, many, many things. What kind of content we're gonna have. So predictions matter. Pattern recognition, again, think about all the things that happen inside of an organization that's about pattern recognition. And the third thing is process automation, now all the processes that need to be automated. And AI factories basically enable you to do that at scale, and that becomes the core operating model of a firm where the data sits across the entire enterprise, right? And then the, the, the operating model is based on software and applications on sitting on top of it. So it's a very different structure of a firm than what we're used to sort of seeing uh, in traditional organizations. And what we've seen all these companies do is they leverage both network effects, right? These platform effects to get more value. By the way, not every company can get these kind of uh, kind of exponential network effects, uh, but also because of their, they have AI, they can actually sharpen this value curve. And then our analysis has been to, so, to show, right? Basically, that we see a collision between a bunch of firms that are organized and can grow exponentially um, with traditional product firms that are typically uh, division-based, unit-based, with not that much data sharing, lots of silos for IT and data that come together. And this causes a, a collision. This causes a collision between the old and the new. This causes a collision between uh, a convex curve and a concave curve. Right, and we sort of seen this over and over again in, in a range of industries. We saw this first emerge in the software business. I see David Yaffe is here. He wrote the classic book on Microsoft, and then also on Netscape, and so basically showed how these companies use platform and network effects to really conquer their markets. But that same philosophy, and by the way, David has an amazing book out as well on on platforms. Um, really, sort of. See, we see that in Merit versus Airbnb. We see Ford versus Waymo and Tesla. We see HSBC versus Ant Group, right? And even Moderna versus Pfizer. And this collision is what we see happening over and over again. The thing to note is that the digital businesses take a while to, to get going. In fact, there's a ton of failure in these digital businesses, right? Because getting this exponential growth is very hard to do. So traditional businesses deliver value early. Right, And everybody that's in a traditional business will look at a digital business and say, why would I ever invest in this? This makes no sense. But this is precisely the moment when, in fact, investment is needed so that we can get this sort of an exponential thing. 
it's like easy for us to say, but hard to do. We've sort of seen a ton of research to say what the transformation uh, looks like and how, how do we how do we pull that off. But by the, but by the way, this this curve that we sort of see right is is also what we sort of experience in the COVID crisis, right? COVID is an exponential disease process. Right, that none of us understood, right? And we had fixed hospital capacity. So the same kind of analogies sort of hold here. And so, so, but what we saw is a whole range of companies try to figure this out and go beyond just a pure information data play and an Airbnb, for example, into the world of you know self-driving cars or even in, in the world of biotech. And so, you know, I spent a bunch of time with Moderna. I've been an advisor to them as well. And what you saw Moderna do as an 800 person startup company is have at their core digital data and AI and really push that to enable them to create, uh, you know, lots of, uh, lots of um, uh, capabilities with mRNA, but also to be able to very quickly pivot from the work they were doing in other disease areas and apply it to, to, um, to, uh, uh, to the the COVID crisis, and then an 800 person company then is as able to compete in the COVID vaccine space as a 100 thousand person company like Pfizer as well. And this becomes a, a key key way for us to start thinking about that. Another crazy example that we've sort of seen emerge about using the same principles and applying it to other sort of atoms industries, so biotech is Shein. Those of you that have teenagers in your house, you know that many of them are probably buying lots of products on Shein. And what's incredible about Shein is that their velocity of new products, their velocity of communication, the velocity of engagement with their users is incredible. So they launch about 2,500 new products per day. Okay, and it's 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 built as a two-sided platform where AI helps them come up with product ideas. They can then put them, they can get them manufactured at a very low cost. A hundred items initially from about 4,500 suppliers, uh, factory owners in China, right? And they match supply with demand. And once they get signal that a sweater is going to get hot, they can make a hundred thousand more in basically a week. Huge questions about pollution, about, you know, uh, uh, child labor, many, many questions. But what we're seeing, though, right, is the beginnings of taking what we learned in the tech industry, using AI and platforms at the core to get extraordinary growth. Um, but there's, there's, there's a whole range of questions we need to answer about how we run our companies, about security, privacy, bias, control, transparency, and so on and so forth. Big, big questions that will not go away. So let me set that stage for you now to say, okay, now, now let's fast forward to the moment that we're in today, right? And how do we make sense of the moment we're in today? And the way I think about this is, first is that we don't need to look historically. And what we sort of see is that there have been four waves of AI that, that, that have happened in the world. There was a cybernetics era in the 50s. Um, then there was trained experts and expert systems in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then the world started to shift because the browser got invented, uh, everybody got connected, lots of data started to come, up, come about, and the machine learning systems took off, right? The good learners emerged. Good learners emerged, and what they started to do was take the data that these platforms had and then do analysis, do lots of analysis. And so today in our personal lives, you know, with our smartphones, my smartphone, right, with our smartphones, right, we basically have uh, uh, sort of AI superpowers inside of here, right? So our music recommendations on Spotify, our YouTube recommendations, uh, our, our navigation, you know, you name it, uh, our content consumption, all of that is being mediated through AI. But those AI systems were in the plumbing, right? They were in the plumbing of, of, of these companies. They weren't obvious to us that that's what we were getting. We were getting navigations and we're, and we're getting like new playlists, but they were not basically done in a way that the consumers could really feel. What happened with generative AI was that we all of a sudden had a moment where basically generative AI systems were massively and easily available to consumers, to each of us. We didn't need a PhD in, in data science or in artificial intelligence to be able to use these systems anymore. They were available to us in a basic a chat interface. But what does this look like for us? 
What does this mean? So these slides come from Flagship. I spend a bunch of time with them, helping them think about uh, sort of AI-focused companies in biology. And what the folks showed me there is like, look, we're taking off, literally off-the-shelf models that are current today and applying them to biology. So uh, this is my good friend, Armin McRachin. Uh, he's a principal uh, at, at Flagship. Uh, and you know, you, we can take his his photo and then we can put, put it through a, a stability, uh, stable diffusion and create all of these nice avatars, right? At zero cost. Now, what's interesting is that that's basically essentially the same diffusion AI models uh, strategy that we're seeing here can be applied to create brand new medicines. Right, brand new proteins that have not existed before. A lot more work, a lot more activities, right? But the same so software principles are being applied. Similarly, what we saw in reinforcement learning, like again, a cute example of AlphaGo beating these, these Go, Go chess masters, the same reinforcement learning approaches can be used to design better drugs, okay? By exploring the vast chemical space. And similarly, large language models that we're sort of seeing, right, we can then, uh, one of the flagship companies, Monti Health, is applying it to optimize chemistry for molecular nutrition. And what we see is the time from innovation to practical application to startup to, 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 to usage inside of companies is shrinking, is shrinking dramatically. And that's what's so exciting about this. So, so let, let's put this, this era into context and how do we, how should we think about this? Some of you are old enough to remember this logo. This logo is, comes from 1992 and it's the Mosaic web browser. If you remember, there was 30 years of the internet, Archie, Gopher, Usenet, uh, Telnet, FTP that was around before, uh, and even email, <laughs> uh, before the browser got invented. Uh, and so there was lots of work on the internet and we all knew the internet was gonna be big, but nobody knew what it would do until the browser got invented. And what the browser did is that it basically massively lowered the cost of information transmission. And I remember seeing a browser, uh, seeing the Oxford coffee pot for the first time on a, on a, on a browser in 1994 and being stunned that that was the internet. And, but the thing to note is that if all of a sudden in 1994, uh, the Oxford Coffee Pot, which was basically uh, a lab, researchers at a lab at a, at a lab at Oxford University were too lazy to go to the next room and check if there was coffee or not. So they put a camera on it and create a web page on it. If now all of a sudden an obscure coffee pot at an obscure lab at Oxford University had global distribution of information, you could know what 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 that meant. And so the the drop in the cost of information transmission led to all of these giants like Google and Baidu and so on and so forth. But, and our whole internet life changed because of this, right? Cost of information transmission goes to zero, new things emerge. Um, some of you still may have Napster or some uh, variants of it from now on and illegal music in your, in your hard drives. What did Napster do? Napster did two things. It lowered the cost of information distribution and it lowered the cost of music acquisition and unbundled the, the single from the album, right? And gave birth to iTunes and Spotify in many ways. If you, if you think about the iPhone, what did the iPhone do? It did, again, two things. It lowered the cost of software distribution. You remember we used to go to the micro center and buy boxes or we'd go to Best Buy or Sears and buy boxes of, of software. Well, now it was available through the cloud and available to us directly on our phones. But also any kid could now be a software developer through Apple's uh, iOS uh, APIs. And so, so again, we get to sort of see this, this very interesting cost of distribution and cost of development goes to zero. And then of course, that creates a billion apps, including TikTok. And so the question for us is, what has ChatGPT done? What has ChatGPT done? Um, and what I contend is that ChatGPT has lowered the cost of cognition, lowered the cost of problem solving, lowered the cost of creativity. And I'll give you some evidence for that as well. And then we'll get to some of your questions here as well. So again, again, we can take an economic analysis and say like what happens when the cost and price of knowledge work drops and quality also increases. 
So in a lot of my work on crowdsourcing, what we always argued was that what crowdsourcing enabled us to do was to sample the entire distribution of performance uh, for folks, right? Uh, so that you could get the best solution, the, these extreme value solutions or these extreme value people on the right tail of the distribution. Now, now the way to think about this is, you know, you now imagine for any given task flow that there's a set of people that are really good and a set of people that are average and a set of people that are not so good, right? And now imagine I give them the superpowers of chat GPT for the task flow. What might that do? And so what we contend in a lot of our work these days is that it's basically shifting the distribution to the right, right? You take any distribution, you shock it with cognitive tools, right? And it basically uh, narrows the distribution and also shifts it to the right, but also potentially uh, does a left tail censoring as well. Because what will happen is that whoever's in the left tail of the distribution is basically going to come to the average of wherever the AI is at. And we expect three distinctive activities that happen to workers. There's going to be replacement story. Some workers will get replaced. Some functions will get replaced. There's going to be an augmentation story, which is my Iron Man suit, right? So Tony Stark is a mere mortal, right? When, but he gets to play with uh, the Marvel super superhero universe and the gods like Thor because he's got the Iron Man suit. So you get augmentation and then you will also get transformation. New roles will be defined along the way. And this became pretty stark to me, uh, you know, when ChatGPT was introduced, when I was on Twitter following a bunch of folks, and there was a venture capitalist from uh, from California who spent a bunch of time volunteering with immigrant entrepreneurs who had lawn care businesses, who had a fencing businesses, and so forth. And they typically had really bad English, and so he would help them teach English and help them communicate with their with their customers so that they could get more business. Um, and then all of a sudden he said, once ChatGPT came out, I could just ask them to put their broken Spanglish inside of ChatGPT, and they'll get perfect Harvard English perfect Harvard, um, uh, Oxford English as well. So this is the left tail story, right? The left tail that struggles mightily with a particular skill can now get the superpowers of the AI. Similar to me and me as an artist, terrible artist, but now I can get to mid journey and create for at least by my standards, beautiful art. My daughter probably won't agree so, but at least for me, it's like incredible. So, so you were very interested in sort of pursuing this hypothesis and uh, over the last nine months, uh, a large team of us has basically been thinking about this and doing a project uh, with the Boston Consulting Group uh, to uh, deploy uh, ChatGPT inside the workforce itself. Uh, there's nine of us because there's a massive team needed to pull this off. Um, and the way we conceive of this is that AI, especially generative AI, is kind of weird. It's good at creativity, but bad at math. And you wouldn't think AI would be bad at math because it's like statistics based, logic based, but in fact, generative AI systems are really bad at math. They can't do math with anything that well. So any kind of a task flow that people get engaged in, right? There's a set of folks who are set up, uh, uh, there's a set of tasks that are inside the frontier of AI's performance and a set of tasks that are outside the frontier of the uh, human performance. Uh, so we released this paper in SSRN, uh, you know, about, about Two weeks ago, uh, we've been super happy with the uptake uh, in it. Um, but uh, but let me tell you what what we what we did as a design. So so it was an experiment with BCG. We have basically seven percent of BCG's global individual contributor consultants workforce inside of this experiment, and we randomly assigned them to different conditions of no AI access. Uh, GPT-4 AI access uh, and GPT-4 with a little bit of prompt engineering overview access. We, you know, we had a structure where we basically did initial survey. We test them on these tasks, on these real tasks, and then we see how well they do in these conditions. Here's what we discovered for for BCG consultants. And remember, these are graduates from elite universities. Okay, uh, consultants using the AI task complete the task 25% faster. Okay, and did 12% more tasks. Okay, uh, overall, the, the on average, of uh, 40% higher quality of those using AI versus those not using AI. Our paper has all the dimensions of quality we looked at, you know, both human rated and machine rated, 
they all correlate uh, uh, directionally in the same same way, in the same 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 perspective. Um, but also uh, is a skills leveler, right? It's, it basically levels uh, uh, the, the 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 normal distribution. The consultants who are below average on the on the on the calibration tasks improve by forty three percent with AI, while those above average improve by seventeen percent. Kind of crazy numbers, and we had, we were like freaked out, and we really pushed hard on those numbers to make sure that they were in fact the right things that came through. But here's the downside, right? Tasks that were outside the AI's capability frontier saw a 19% decrease in correct solutions. So if the task, and in this case, the task was such that they had to analyze a spreadsheet and make sense of it with interview notes, right? Those that used AI did worse. Okay, and then we saw two patterns of human AI collaboration: uh, centaurs, uh, easy task division between humans and AI, and cyborgs integrated workflow uh, with AI. And so here's what the first uh, graphic looks like: you can sort of see the right shift, right, and the narrowing of the distributions in interesting ways, um, and and the sort of this 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 real effect of GPT uh, providing uh, two consultants, uh, and they had basically uh, 18 tasks. That they were doing in this flow of tasks that, that were coming together. Um, and here is the skills level, right? Basically, the bottom half of the skills participants increased by 43%, right? The top half skill participants increased by about 17%. Um, now, note, you know, like most elite firms, you know, uh, they don't like to talk about poor performers, right? Uh, because everybody's above average at these companies. Uh, and so, uh, so they're all from Lake Wobegon, but you get the point, right? In, in any kind of a situation, you can create a normal distribution and see where people are compared to, compared to the average that might exist. And this is what we sort of saw. This is the thing that would be worrying you, right? This is this this is showing that our in our control in our in our task that was outside the frontier, right? Eighty five percent of the people without ChatGPT did well, versus sixty percent and seventy percent only with with ChatGPT usage. Here is the thing that is actually even more disturbing, which is the following. So regardless of your correctness of your assessment, because there was a right or wrong answer in this task, right? Your you are more convincing, okay? So if you look at the right uh, right panel in this graph, what you see is that participants who were wrong on the experimental task, right? Their quality of the recommendation, how convincing they were about their wrong answer, was eighteen percent better than the folks that were uh, that were had no had no chat GPT, right? Which again tells you that you know like like this can this can go horribly in the wrong direction as well. Um, and then what we saw was again sort of this 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 perspective of a bunch of folks that were centaurs, a bunch of folks that did the right division between themselves and the AI, and really uh, separated the task. And then cyborgs, those that basically use AI in their in their particular workflow. We see both of those emerge. Um, we don't right now are able to tell you if there's if it's correlated to quality, but we're doing a lot of analysis to sort of uh, get us there. Um, and then so so in summary, what I was sort of saying is that you want to think about generative AI as a co-pilot. You want to really think of it as something that is this genius RA, genius intern you have that can never get sick of you. You can change your mind every single day and it's fine. At the same time, right, it can go wrong. And we need to understand where the frontier is. The frontier is of course gonna change over time. It's gonna get better, but there will always be a frontier where AI is good, where AI is not bad. And as we start to bring these technologies into the workplace, into the school place, right, we'll need to start thinking about you know what we what we do. So with that, I'm going to stop the screen sharing. I'm going to look at some of the 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 Q and A and and try to answer some of the questions. One person said, you know, what's your advice to a CEO on how to prepare uh, her and his organization for the AI age? I mean, I think the 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 time is now. Uh, in many ways, uh, you know, I have ten different large language models now available on my phone. So the blanket bans that many companies have done about this, I think, are foolish and are going to hurt them. Uh, what I would sort of say is that this is a yeah, this is a, an opportunity that I think is as big, if not bigger, than what we sort of saw with the web browser, and that changed the world. Uh, and so we need to get ourselves ready to think about how 
AI augmentation will change work processes, workflows, and organizations, and to start the work now instead of deferring on it as well. Uh, um, you know, uh, somebody else also asked, what are some essential roles in every organization that you would not suggest be replaced by AI in the near future and why? I actually don't know because, I mean, I think if you believe my speculation that this is about a cognitive enhancement, then wherever we're using our brains, wherever we're using our, our, our cognition, we would see some effects. If I go back to that normal distribution, well, what do we see? You know, potentially we have a doctor's crisis in rural America, shortage of doctors. Could nurse practitioners with AI do as good as doctors? Potentially, right? We don't have enough primary care physicians. Could this in fact be the, the panacea for that problem? Don't know, but we can imagine this. Uh, similarly, similarly, uh, um, uh, uh, I would I would argue paralegals. Paralegals could become as good as lawyers with these with this tooling as well. Uh, big implications for our medical schools and law schools. Um, I tell you, I showed this uh, the, these slides to our folks at uh, at HBS, and they were like, "Should I still be at HBS? Should I just go out and learn how to use ChatGPT really well?" I said, no, no, you still need expert knowledge. You still need a foundation knowledge to, know, to learn how to ask the right questions. And in fact, I think the liberal arts education is going to be uh, super useful for this, uh, uh, for us um, as well. Naveen asked a good question. What are some good YouTube channels you recommend? I would, do, the YouTube algorithms are so good. Just put in chat engine, chat GPT prompt engineering, and you're going to get lots of recommendations, see whose personality you like and go follow them. YouTube has been my friend to learn how to do prompting and to think about this um, as well. Um, um, so a, a really good question is, isn't quality control by humans still an issue? For example, chat GPT generated brief uh, with non-existent case citations. Yes, absolutely. So the hallucinations are a real problem with chat GPT. I would definitely agree with you and with large language models, but I think, at the moment, we're all trapped to think about the internet and, and searching for information through the Google model, which is Google's done a good job to get, get us the right link, right? So we think about using computers to find the right information. We go to Wikipedia, we go to, to Google search, and we find the right information. That'd be like, you know, uh, what was the price of my airline ticket, you know, what some factoid is and so on and so forth. I think large language models, at least today, as they're set up, should not be used for information search purposes. I mean, you can connect a browser to it and do things and summarize articles and so forth, but think of it as a cognitive partner. If it's your cognitive partner, you gotta now learn how to use this tool to think with you. And it's, it's only as good as your skill in using the tool. And so that's why we, we get confused because I put my bio in and it completely hallucinated. I right? made up stuff that I, articles that I wrote, cases that I wrote. And on the one hand, I'm like, I'm just like oh, this is terrible. This, this, I don't want to use this. But on the other hand, I'm like, oh, this is giving me ideas about the papers I should have written, the, the, the cases I should, have, I should have done. I see Carrie Herman here. Carrie, I got all these ideas of all the new cases we need to be writing together. Um, and so, and so, so the point is, if it's a cognitive tool, we now need to learn how to use this, this superpower, which knows everything about the internet. And now how do I use it as a thinking partner instead of like an information search tool? So that's what I would sort of uh, uh, advise you on that. One of the things we did and I think it's important for us to, to note, one of the things we did is in the, in, the, in, the, in the symposium on Friday for Claudine Gay's uh, inauguration, there was a, the, 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 the generative AI symposium. You know, we asked people, uh, Dean Stubbs asked people to stand up if they had used generative AI, 90% of the room stood up. You know, then they asked, do you think generative AI is gonna change the world? Uh, their their jobs, their roles in the next three years, 90% of the people stood up. And then he asked the question, you know, will generative AI, how many of you are using generative AI tools today? And less than 10% of the people stood up. And this gap, this knowing doing gap is, is massive everywhere I've seen. I've asked this question over and over again in a range of settings. And I see this 90, 90, 10. 90% 90 think 
it's the best thing ever, it's gonna change the world, their lives, but only 10% are actually using it. And I think the problem that we face today is that this has a learning curve. It's like learning how to ride a bike. If you're an adult and, and it is, you know, you know, and and now you need to go through the pain of like falling down, falling down, this breaking apart, not working properly, your performance dropping until you get the gist of it, and then your performance improves. And so I think this becomes a, a key key element here for us to to be considering as we uh, um, uh, uh, as well. Uh, 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 there's a great philosopher, a virtue ethicist here. Uh, 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 oh, for moral decision making. Oh my goodness, uh, I would only get this question at Harvard. Uh, I, I think it's a great question. You know, I mean, I think I think the very interesting capability of this these AI systems is to take on personas. Um, you can ask it to be, uh, you know, in fact, a colleague of mine, Ayla Israeli, in our marketing department has done a study that has shown that at least for market research, so very pedestrian market research studies, uh, Chad GPT 3.5 gave economically rational answers. So you could go to Chad GPT and in fact, do your focus groups and do your market research initially with these uh, virtual customers. I bet you that, that we could potentially create sort of uh, uh, virtual citizens, right? Create personas for various types of citizens and then engage them in dialogue, engage them in moral dilemmas and see how people react and how these virtual things react. Now, of course, there's an alignment problem with these AI systems. You know, many of them are sort of told not to go after difficult subjects and so forth. So we have to fix that. But certainly as a simulator for the how various personas might in fact react to situations and using that as a basis to then go and test in real real settings or as a, as a tutorial will be quite quite interesting you know khan migo uh, sal khan the 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 founder of uh, khan academy has created khan migo which is a which is a um a, a, a robotic assistant for students taking uh khan academy classes and what they did is that they said, we're not going to train the robot to give you the right answers, but to be your companion to, in your learning process so that it will prompt you to think about the answers, think about it deeply, give you different analogies so you can figure out the answers yourself. And I imagine uh, that a similar things could be done, uh, for example, with, um, with a, uh, uh, a, um, uh, a, a, a robot uh, 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 for, for ethics as well. Uh, oh, so yeah, I'll take this as the last question, uh, <laughs> uh, which is how will educators such as myself and myself distinguish work between that is created by AI or does it even matter? I think I, it's done. The kids today are using AI to come up with their essay answers. It's being done. Uh, and if they're not, they better you better teach them how to do it. And then I think the question becomes, and this is the this is the real interesting opportunity for us as educators. We've had, you know, a thousand years of universities with a model in which uh, we would impart some wisdom, we would impart some knowledge. Students would work at it, and then they would come back and then demonstrate their knowledge to us. Um, in the BCG study that I gave you that I showed you about, we did some interesting pretesting. Uh, you know, and we saw some dramatic differences, like two hours to do a task, 20 minutes to get it done with chat GPT. But the reaction from the consultants was something that I did not expect. One of them said, this feels like junk food, right? I'm faster, I'm better, but this still, still feels like junk food. So I think there's a generation that are gonna struggle with how to use this in their own work, but many people are gonna see the benefits and dive right into it. And then what do we do in teaching that's gonna matter? So, you know, we teach by case method. You can put any case in, even if you don't upload the case into ChatGPT, and it will have really good answers that will solve the case dilemma. So I, when I teach now, I'm like, I expect you to put this through ChatGPT one way or the other and have answers. Given those answers, let's now dive into what we've really learned and apply. So we have this 
this case that tortures all MBA students called National Cranberry. It's really a, a story about a cranberry farm, but it's about bottlenecks in an operations process. Generations of HBS uh, students have had have scar tissue from that case. That was remembered as a rite of passage. Now you put this into ChatGPT, it will give you the answer. And the question now for us is, okay, now that we understand bottlenecks really, right? Now let's think about its application in 10 different domains in the classroom and think through how you would go solve that problem. So instead of the heavy duty calculations on how to calculate bottlenecks and people getting mind uh, numbingly bored from it, can we actually have a very different learning experience? And I think that's gonna be our responsibility as educators, that we have the opportunity to radically, radically change how we teach. So with BPAL, one of the conversations that I'm encouraging BPAL to have is we have an amazing, uh, um, this is why, by the way, David Nealon was so successful by, by, by having uh, uh, a, a chatbot get integrated as a tutor inside of CS50 because all the lectures were recorded, all the interactions have been recorded, and then you could use that to create a large language model just for the course. I think VPAL has amazing opportunity to take all the transcripts from all the courses that has been created and in fact, create a personalized tutor for each course. Now, once you have that personalized tutor available for each course, what will we do in the classroom? That becomes the exciting part for us. So with that, we're almost at time. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna turn it back to Alicia for some final housekeeping things. Thank you so much uh, for hanging out. Hopefully you found this interesting, uh, and uh, you know please don't hesitate to uh, uh, to reach out uh, and ask any further questions to me as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kareem, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We hope you'll join us for more signature events soon. Information on upcoming events as well as recordings of past ones can be found at vpal.harvard.edu/vpal-events. Thank you.